Hi, my name is Jennifer Lin, and thanks to Ed for the introduction. I am one of the newer, I can no longer say newest, members of the Crossref staff. I lost that right. But I'm very excited to have joined uh, Crossref, and my talk is going to be slightly different um, because Ed kicked us off earlier today, as well as yesterday, um, with a lot of the the, the, the trends that we're seeing already happening with the expansion of Crossref. Um, my colleagues later this afternoon will talk quite a bit about what we've accomplished this year in specific detail, hopefully not too much, um, as well as a look ahead. I'm going to walk you through a little bit about my experience as I arrived at the gates of Crossref about over, a little over two months ago. But just let me quickly say that the product team, we've always had product managers at Crossref, and um, that was one of, why, one of the reasons why I was so thrilled about joining the organization. Um, but moving forward, what we're going to be doing is consolidating all of the product efforts into a core team so that any of the future development releases um, and the support that we offer all of the products and services um, will, be, will take the form of a much more consolidated and streamlined workflow. Um, the product team itself is made up of two product managers. We have one coming in on board replacing Rachel, who is moving to Jenny's team as our international advocacy lead. Um, but um, she'll be bringing her experience um, into the Oxford office. Her name is Madeline Watson. She'll be joining in a couple of weeks. We have Christy um, Meddings as our um, staunch and loyal product manager, the first one that Crossref has had. And we have a new UX UI designer, experience designer, um, coming on board in a couple of weeks. And we have Patricia Vini, who has been leading up product support for quite a while, and um, a new hire, Ben Peek, who will be working with her um, out of the Boston office. So that is the product team, and we're excited to to come back next year and talk more about how this team, how we've um, developed roots and, um, and really drove a lot of the, 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 the new development, working with outreach, um, working with both of the engineering teams within Crossref. But let me get started. Um, when I arrived at the gates of Crossref, my first impression was like, oh my goodness, this is massive. What is it that we are doing? Who is it that we are doing it for? First off, we all know that Crossref um, is only Crossref because of our member publishers who deposit the metadata. What does metadata do? It enables connections. Um, whether you're a founding member, whether you are the thousandth publisher to join, the 2,000th, 3,000th, or 4,000th member, this particular story about metadata that I would like to share that comes from my experience getting to, to, to learn the ropes um, I hope it foregrounds where you fit in this picture and the importance that you play depositing the metadata, using the metadata, and most importantly, a view into the longer term end game for this entire enterprise. As Martin E. pointed out, and, um, and very honestly, I appreciate, there are a number of ways to deposit the metadata. It's a very, very confusing process. For those of you who have been doing it quite a while, you may even find yourself in a very similar position. Um, when it, uh, I'll talk a little bit later about how this is going to be one of the focus for us this year. But there are tons of ways for which publishers can deposit their, their full metadata in XML, for ways in which they can provide resource-only um, XML to us. There are ways in which you can deposit all of the metadata in, in CSV format or in PDF, or you can manually enter it in. Tons of them. It's quite a mess, but there are many ways in. So what do we do? We then process the, X, the, the file. We um, do a number of XML validation. The big reels, wheels are churning. And at a certain point, we have cross-ref valid XML. We conduct integrity checks, we register the DOI, we update the database, and we send out the results. This is Chuck and his team. They're fantastic. <laughs> At a certain point, though, we have all of the metadata that's been processed, normalized, and cleaned up into the big vat. And then what happens? That's when a lot of the fun begins, the connecting and the linking at scale. 
So the connecting and the linking, um, we're making associations between the research outputs, the research objects that um, have newly registered DOIs. We're making connections between these DOIs and other research objects, scholarly artifacts, say, um, through a link of citation, a scholarly citation. We're making links to any researchers that have ORCID IDs deposited by the publisher members. Also funders through our funder data. There are increasingly a lot of activities surrounding many of these DOIs. And one of the product launches, which you have heard about yesterday, we'll talk more about DET, that will start linking these DOIs with the activities that are happening on outside platforms, whether they are blog mentions, social media shares, Wikipedia references, um, et cetera. There are also links to data and software and other materials and resources that are being sent by publisher members. And we're making those links too, creating what you see is um, the webbing of scholarly communications. So that's, in essence, the very, very high-level picture. It's an ideal situation, I have to say, because the reality is, is today, not all links are being made that are possible. This is what happens when not all links are made. We have entities that are hanging out alone, and what is the downfall of this unfortunate, unfortunate circumstance? Is that with, by hanging out alone, you'll be much, much harder to find. And as publisher members, I'm sure that one of your key services that you offer your community is discoverability to the, the, the research that you, that you have published. So this is definitely not an ideal situation. My suggestion is do not put yourself in a dead zone. Don't create that dead zone for yourself where your signals aren't getting through where you can't be found. By depositing the full breadth of metadata possible, Crossref will link you up. It will make the connections across the scholarly web. And at a certain point, it becomes an open scholarly map for the entire research enterprise. So once we have all of this metadata, the wheels have turned, Chuck's team has done its job, um, and it's, everything's been cleaned up. What happens then? Well, that's also part of the fun, the second half of the picture. Once we have the map, we have tons of ways in which we can slice and dice the data and deliver it where it matters. These are just a smattering of the different ways in which we're delivering um, different tranches of this open map of scholarly communications. Um, also, to note, many of these logos represent former names of products and services, and as Ginny mentioned, we, one of the fun efforts that we'll be kicking off um, for next year is rolling out a whole set of new names that tie straight back to Crossref brand, brand, brand profile, um, as well as a facelift for, for all of these products and services. But as you can tell, there, all of this is just metadata. Metadata that belongs on that open scholarly map, but can be found and once it's linked up so that it can be delivered out. I'd like to think of these different products slash services as interactive layers on this scholarly map. We have contributors, funders, we have um, research outputs that, that continue to evolve over time, whether that be versions, corrections, or retractions. There are access indicators, right, um, that enable text and data mining. We have other affiliated research artifacts that are connected up to the DOIs that you've registered with us. There's a lot of social activity on the publication. All of these are just different layers on the same underlying map itself. I'd like to pose this perhaps provocative claim that it's like G-maps, but harder. I'd asked Chuck yesterday, so exactly how many DOIs are being registered on a weekly basis? And he said, well, weekends, it drops, obviously. But on average, we have about 10 to 15,000 new locations on our map every single day, new DOIs. That doesn't even count the new number of events and new links that are occurring on this map. So this is a map that is changing constantly by the second. Also, in contrast to GMAPs, 
Sometimes no roads exist and we have to build them. These are roads that we find out through, say, for example, the DOI event tracker. There was just a Wikipedia article that just mentioned a new DOI. That edit was made, is, will be made in two minutes from now. That's something that the researcher will not know about. That is something that the publisher at this point in time may not know about. These are roads that we will be building on the scholarly map. This is the only picture that I have that is kind of out of aesthetics, out of the, the black and white aesthetics, but I just thought it was so cool. In the New York Times Magazine last week, they um, showcased a project called Scan Labs, and what this group has been doing, they've been taking mobile lasers and scanning the um, many different places in London, and this is, and they don't just do one scan, they do thousands and thousands of them, um, and over time, they create layers um, that are made possible by the algorithmic processing of the software under, underneath it. But as a result of it, you get a view of what a machine sees when they look at the London Bridge. So I'd like to s suggest that the metaphor here is that we are 3D scanning the landscape with the Crossref metadata, creating the scholarly map so that not just humans can traverse it online through user interface, but also machines. If they be driverless cars, or they just be text and data mining scripts. So again, instead of a map of streets, bridges, and highways, we have Crossref's map of scholarly communications. Who uses the scholarly roadmap? There's quite a, a very impressive bundle already. I won't go over all, all of them, but these are already relationships, partnerships that Crossref has. These entities, corporate, governmental, non-governmental, they're all accessing the scholarly map. So the question is, how much metadata would you like to deposit to make sure you're found? So, 2016, I'm just going to speak briefly and wrap up. There's tons of plans, and um, I welcome conversation afterwards to talk more in detail about all of them. But one of our aims and focuses for next year is to streamline the whole metadata deposit process. We have no less than six or seven different user interfaces by which members can deposit their metadata whether it's the first time they're registering their DOI or whether they come back and deposit only resource information. We're going to consolidate that all to make it simple, a single entryway to be able to do all that you need in order to deposit your full metadata. We'd like to, in strengthening the core content coverage, quality, and accuracy, also work on improving our content delivery and establishing service programs. So the product, the publisher support, as I mentioned, consolidating all the ways in, providing member publishers with an easy way to quickly look at everything that was deposited, places that you don't have coverage, some of your dead zones you may not even know about, um, and provide custom prompts and instructions to help address fixing those dead zones, providing much more enhanced support to guide you through these thickets and providing a set of incentives and rewards for following best practices. The participation reports is one of the cool new projects that Jeff will talk more about. Expanding user support. Once we have this map, um, all of those consumers of the Open Scholarly map, as well as us included, we're going to be working on providing much more real-time expansion monitoring of this knowledge graph to be able to report on it to everyone. Better tools for human discovery, for machine navigab navigability, and tighter integration with our partners. I think you've heard quite a bit about the DOI event tracker if you were here yesterday. If not, do find out more. We will be launching this in the middle of next year. An associated service called distributed usage logging is also on tap for next year. And Ed earlier today mentioned moving um, to include preprints as one of our op form object types. So just to close, I'd like to say, with all of that earlier narrative, think of Crossref as an infrastructure provider that lays out the open scholarly map for, the re for research communications, for research itself. You decide where to go. We give you the roadmap. Thank you. <laughs>